It is one of the holiest books in the world. Key scriptures for the Dalai Lama. And an exact description of what flatliners experience while clinically dead. Written in the 8th century, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a guide for the dying. A map for the journey we will face in the afterlife. I think the Tibetan Book of the Dead is the first how-to book. And how did it capture the imagination of so many in Western culture? Anyone who picks up the book can learn something from it. There's some kind of wisdom there that's universal. And what does the Book of the Dead offer the living? We have a tool that in this very lifetime we can attain freedom. These matters affect us all. And if ancient Tibetan culture is correct, the Book of the Dead is nothing less than the key to life after death and the answer to humanity's oldest questions. Death, it is humanity's greatest mystery. Shakespeare called it the unknown country, the land from which no man returns. Every culture has stared at death and has wondered at its finality, but none has solved its ultimate mystery. In a remote corner of the world, however, one people believes that it knows exactly what happens after death. They say the answers are contained in a mysterious 1,200-year-old text called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The Tibetan Book of the Dead can be uh, understood like a Thomas Guide, you know, map quest for everyone who ever wants to find ultimate meaning in the life and afterlife experiences. I think the Tibetan Book of the Dead is perhaps the first how-to book. It's a manual. It's a guidebook for the deceased to travel through the afterworld with advice from day to day. For centuries, this book was kept secret in an isolated land known as the Forbidden Kingdom. But then, in the early years of the 20th century, a lone American went on a spiritual quest. His name was Walter Evans Wentz, an Oxford-educated folklorist in search of ancient wisdom. He traveled alone through Europe, Arabia, India, and finally came to the borders of Tibet and the Himalaya mountains. And there, in a small monastery, he became the first Westerner to read the book that claimed to know the mysteries of life after death. This is, this is a profoundly spiritual text, but it's also challenging experientially. In that way, this is, this is quite scientific. It also has a good philosophical orientation to it. Evans Wentz spent three years helping translate the text, which he published in English in 1927. Today, this extraordinary book can be bought in any major bookshop, in one of several translations, and its supporters range from Hollywood actors to the Dalai Lama. Written in the 8th century, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a precise description of what each individual will endure in the afterlife, an experience that Tibetans call the Bardo. When they passed away, then they will reborn and somewhere else between the births. That's time we call intermediate life. In Tibetan, we call bardo. In Tibetan Buddhism, the emphasis that's a lot because we consider that that's, uh, uh, this life is important. 
but uh, not as important as next lives. Intriguingly, stories from the Tibetan Book of the Dead seem to match the modern descriptions of those pronounced clinically dead on the operating table, so-called near-death experiences. I think the similarity is spine tingling. Almost everyone talks about this blinding light. Um, often it's called the white light. In the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they talk about the white light. It's very clear. It's very alluring. The text of the book describes the light with precision. O oh, nobly born, that which is called death has now come. Now thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. It's very seductive. And the fascinating thing about near-death stories is that they want to go toward the light. And when the doctor is bringing them back to consciousness in the ER room, they feel a reluctance to leave. Whether in a modern western city or a remote Tibetan village, the one constant for all mankind is the mystery of death. Death has come to a small village in rural Tibet. The time could be yesterday, it could have been centuries ago. In Tibet, the rituals of the dead have remained the same for at least the last 600 years. A young man has died in the village. His family mourns his passing and begins to prepare for the coming funeral. The dead man's mother has sent for the local Buddhist monks, or lamas. The monks settle at the side of his body in order to read from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Their words are meant to guide the dead man through the frightening world of the afterlife. O oh, nobly born, thou art departing from this world, but thou art not the only one. Death cometh to all. The experience will be terrifying. In the bardo, they can see lots of different lights, different images, lots of confusion. Also, it has lots of fear. Only the Tibetan Book of the Dead can guide a soul safely to a new life. To understand the power of the book, one must first understand its roots. Tibetans practice a form of Buddhism, one of the great religions of Asia. It began 500 years before the birth of Jesus with the teachings of an Indian holy man known to his followers as the Buddha, or the Awakened One. Well, Buddhism is a very old tradition, 2,500 years old. For this period, it has traveled and become assimilated in a wide variety of cultures. And I mean, internally, very diverse cultures, from Afghanistan 1,500 years ago, uh, to North Korea, to Siberia, to Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, and China, of course, Tibet. But despite the diversity in this wide range of teachings within the, this broad Buddhist tradition, there are some core themes that one can say, well, this is, this is Buddhism 101. The basic belief of Buddhism is a simple but profound truth. Life is full of suffering. According to Buddhists, suffering is caused by desire and ignorance. But suffering can be eliminated through meditation, through study, and through compassion. Buddhist, I think, is not just a religion, it's a philosophy. We emphasize two things. One is compassion, one is wisdom. When you earn those two things, then you're already enlightened. A 
concept central to all forms of Buddhism is reincarnation, the idea that after death one is reborn. And with that concept comes the idea of karma, the belief that one's good and evil deeds in this life will be paid for in the next. Tibetan Buddhists will think about, well, I'm not going to do this thing because I know if I do this thing, which is a wrong thing to do, if I don't get punished for it this lifetime, I'm going to have to pay the karma sooner or later. The goal of Buddhism is to step off the eternal wheel of karma and thus be liberated from suffering. The Tibetan Book of the Dead promises a shortcut to liberation. You have techniques for actually jettisoning the consciousness of the deceased out of, out of the body and into a better realm. For centuries, the secrets of the Tibetan Book of the Dead were guarded in the mountain vastnesses of the Himalayas until its publication in English in the 1920s. It's never gone out of print since 1927. There's been six or more other translations from the Tibetan. So it's continuing to maintain that hold on, on uh, Western imagination. The book became even more famous in 1964 when psychedelic guru Timothy Leary retranslated it, proclaiming that the Tibetan sacred text was the ideal description of an LSD trip. The Tibetan Book of the Dead has found its way into Beatles songs, Hollywood films, pop culture slogans, even fashion designs. But beneath it all is the simple but powerful mystery of an ancient culture. But might it be possible to actually know what happens after death? Maybe there is not only great mythic wisdom here, but actually empirical insight into the nature of consciousness. Maybe there is an individual continuity of consciousness beyond death. Does this ancient text from a remote corner of the world hold the answers to mankind's oldest questions? As monks chant prayers for the corpse of a Tibetan man, his spirit begins a terrifying journey. His only guide in the world beyond the grave is the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Death comes to every home. But in Tibet, death and burial practices are unlike any other funeral traditions in the world. They begin with monks chanting prayers at the side of the deceased. Their text is the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It will guide the soul through the stages, or bardos, of the afterlife. O oh, nobly born, this now is the hour of death. Listen with full attention. Thou will experience three bardos. Recognize them. Be not afraid. It is said that it's quite common for such a spirit, a ghost, a bardo being, to come back to this person's familiar habitat, home, the office place, and to be hovering around one's loved ones. The most important thing that family members can do is to silently reassure the soul, hey, everything's going to be okay. You have some important business to attend to, now go do it. After several days, the corpse is prepared for burial by experts in the Tibetan funeral process. The traditional Tibetan funerary traditions they even did it in a special way where they had a special class of people known as Ragyawa who would go and dismember the bodies at the request of the family. According to Tibetan tradition, the body is forced into a fetal position. The spine is broken and the arms and legs are bound together. 
corpse, now half its normal size, is tightly wrapped and allowed to stiffen in a small bundle. The traditional Tibetan funeral is known as sky burial. The bundle is taken to a remote location and left as an offering of food for the vultures. This seems very gruesome and morbid in, from the Western viewpoint, but again, it's a very practical idea. The Tibetans believe that once the body is dead, it is absolutely worthless, unless you give one last gift of this life, which is yourself as food toward other sentient beings. This is the end for the body, but not for the soul. For the next seven weeks, monks will continue to chant from the Tibetan Book of the Dead to guide the wandering soul through the afterlife, or bardo state. O oh, nobly born, be not attached to this world. Be not distracted. Do not fear. The Tibetan form of Buddhism is unlike any other style of this great Asian religion. The Tibetan Book of the Dead is based on the experience of the Tibetan Buddhist yogis and meditators over many, many centuries. I mean, Tibetan Buddhism is undoubtedly one of the, one of the highest forms of spiritual teachings that's appeared on this planet. One of the rare practices of Tibetan Buddhism is the sand mandala. It is a geometric depiction of the cosmos made with colored sand. Its creation is a form of meditation. Its elaborate swirls, gateways and colors each represent a different form of wisdom. It may take the monks weeks to complete one of these beautiful works of art. The physical structure is the representation of the enlightened qualities when it is created with the right kind of motivation. Complete it and maintain that motivation. When it is being consecrated, it is something like bringing the life force to the mandala. The sand mandala is a symbol of life. And as soon as the intricate artwork is completed, it is destroyed. It is a profound symbol of the briefness of life itself and the certainty of death. At the heart of Tibetan beliefs about death and reincarnation lies the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But the creation of the book is as strange and bewildering as its description of the afterlife. It begins with a mysterious figure with magical powers who traveled to Tibet from India. Even his true name is unknown, and through the centuries he has only been known by the title Padma Sambhava, the Lotus Boy. Sambhava was born in a northwest corner of Pakistan in the present-day Swat Valley or perhaps in Afghanistan. Wherever he came from, he ended up in India and became a superstar in terms of his mystical powers. Seven fifty A.D. In Europe, the Vikings were raiding the English coast, and Charlemagne was in the process of uniting the warlike tribes of the continent. In Asia, the Buddha had been dead for 12 centuries. His religion had spread from Afghanistan to Japan. And in the remote Himalayan plateau, Padma Sambhava arrived, bearing the message of Buddhism. His first task was to defeat the evil demons that plagued Tibet by challenging them to magical combat. He didn't just destroy the demons, he converted them, let's say, forcefully uh, to Buddhism. 
and um, all of those indigenous spirits, all those indigenous demons then had a role and continue to have a role in Tibetan religion uh, as protectors of Buddhism. In addition to quelling and converting demons, Padmasambhava performed miracles, healed the sick, prophesied the future, and even taught some of his followers to fly. Padmasambhava's greatest challenge, however, was to defeat death itself. Around the year 800, the Indian saint wrote down specific instructions relating to the process of death and rebirth. He called it Bardo Tur Dur, or the Book of Liberation upon Hearing in the Afterlife. It was unlike any existing Buddhist scripture. Even the Indians who had the knowledge about the way you die and are reborn didn't have a popular Book of the Dead like that. Only the Tibetans. The book's message was so powerful, its guidance so important, that the Buddhist saint decided it was actually dangerous. He felt that the Tibetans were not ready for that teaching, and they might have misunderstood it in some way. Uh, and perhaps it would have been misused by necromantic priests or something in some sort of strange cults. There's a whole elaborate mythology of Padmasambhava's hiding of these teachings, of these texts, providing a prophecy of who would be the one to discover them at a future date. Padmasambhava in these stories is said to have hidden the texts in very strange places, very remote, uh, in the middle of rocks and stones and boulders. Padmasambhava died around 800. His accomplishments were remarkable. He had converted the entire nation of Tibet from a military empire into the most spiritual society on earth. But his greatest work had disappeared. All that was left of the guidebook to the afterlife was a secret prophecy. And 600 years to the day, that prophecy was to be fulfilled. In a Tibetan village, a young man has died. For 49 days, the dead man's spirit is said to wander in the afterlife, guided only by the chanting of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. The Tibetan Book of the Dead describes three stages, or bardos, of the afterlife. Having met a brilliant white light at the moment of death, the dead person then enters the second stage of his journey, the bardo of peaceful deities. O oh, nobly born, before you appears Lord Vajrasattva in the act of union with his female consort, Buddhalochana. The white light of wisdom shines upon you, bright and clear. Each of the peaceful deities offers the soul guidance to paradise or entrance into the sensual pleasures of the gods. But the peaceful deities can be a trap. Then you become too seduced by it and it's so beautiful then you become kind of deluded and, um, and go off into fantasy. The point is to stay centered. Meditation means centering and concentration means centering. Oh, nobly born. Do not be enticed by the soft light of the gods. It is an obstacle to liberation. The goal of the bardo is to achieve enlightenment, not to pursue the pleasures of the gods. And if the soul fails the test of the peaceful deities, he will be forced to encounter their terrifying alter egos, the wrathful deities. Only the chanting of the Buddhist monks can guide the wandering spirit through the bardo of the wrathful deities.
The most elaborate depiction of the Bardo is in the Shithra Mandala, a three-dimensional miniature representation of the afterlife. This exquisite miniature sculpture is the Tibetan Book of the Dead made real. Like the Book of the Dead, its purpose is to help the living prepare for the next life. If you can really get adept and learn about the bardo before you die, then when you slip into the bardo, this bardo of becoming, you may recognize, hey, this is the bardo. There's nothing to be afraid of. This elaborate portrayal of the Tibetan afterlife was first developed in the 8th century. When it was transcribed after a vision by the Indian saint Padmasambhava. But to protect this sacred document from unworthy eyes, he is said to have concealed the book, leaving behind only the prophecy that it would not be discovered for 600 years. Beginning in the 14th century, we began to see these visionaries rediscovering the teachings of Padmasambhava, which he had hidden in the 8th century. Uh, and those figures were called treasure revealers, or tertun. One of the greatest of these tertuns, or treasure revealers, was Karma Lingpa, who is said to have discovered a map to the hidden book in a vision. What's interesting is that the map is written in a code, a special kind of script that no one else can read but the one who's prophesied to discover the text. Around the year 1350, Karma Lingpa followed the map's clues to the Gampodar range of the Himalayas, where he uncovered the long-hidden guide to the afterlife. The discovery of the Book of the Dead had a profound influence on Tibetan Buddhism. Over the following centuries, the book became a standard element in traditional Tibetan death rituals, the key to the ultimate mystery of death and rebirth. But Tibet and its spiritual heritage was to remain isolated from the rest of the world until the 20th century. The story of the Book of the Dead's journey to the West began in 1919 with an American scholar arriving at the foothills of the Himalayas, seeking the wisdom of the East. Walter Evans Wentz was a very intriguing, interesting, insightful individual. Uh, he was, I think, above all, an anthropologist. He also became very fascinated by Tibetan Buddhism, Born in New Jersey in 1878, Evans Wentz studied Celtic mythology at Oxford and was already an established author when he arrived in Asia just after the First World War. But as one of the first Westerners to reach the borders of Tibet, he was astonished by its deeply spiritual culture. Here was a civilization in which, to a very large extent, the primary focus and the magnet for many of the most intelligent, creative, energetic individuals in this civilization for a good thousand years or so was towards the spiritual life. This is the part of the While studying Buddhist meditation, Evans Wentz was presented with a strange document. He was told that it contained the greatest spiritual secret of Tibetan Buddhism, the secret to life after death. Wentz immediately found a local meditation teacher to help him translate the text and write a commentary. Evans Wentz was convinced that he had discovered a profound book of spiritual teaching and felt it was his mission to tell the outside world. This text speaks of the quintessence of the supreme path and reveals the method of attaining enlightenment. It is for those who have hungered after wisdom that this book has been written. 
Walter Evans Wentz. When Evans Wentz published the Tibetan Book of the Dead in 1927, he thought it might appeal to a handful of spiritual seekers. He was wrong. From everything that uh, we can gather in 1927, it was a great hit, bestseller. It hooked into a certain fascination that was uh, re-emerging in that time with the occult and with exotic religious ideas and comparative religion. Thanks to his translation, Evans Wentz became the most influential author on Tibet for a generation. Evans Wentz was a sincere scholar and spiritual seeker. His work is valuable, his language is kind of a little Edwardian, and it's a little bit quaint to us nowadays, but, but his, the works do stand the test of time. A year before Evans Wentz's death in 1965, the book was retranslated by another unconventional scholar. named Timothy Leary. Leary was to claim that the Tibetan Book of the Dead was the perfect Bible for a drug generation. When a person dies in Tibet, he is said to travel through the afterlife for 49 days. Each stage, or bardo, is a test. Each test determines whether his next life will be on Earth, in a heaven, or in a terrifying hell. And the most frightening bardo is an encounter with terrifying demons known as the wrathful deities. O oh, nobly born, this is the bardo of the wrathful deities. The 58 flame enhaloed wrathful blood drinking deities come to dawn. The wrathful beings are simply manifestations of the peaceful beings, but again, uh, they can terrify the uninitiated and the people who don't understand what they really represent and think that they're enemies. The Tibetan Buddhists create these images of absolutely horrible looking demons with fangs and bulging eyes and blood curdling weaponry and so the person has already been contemplating these images and the paintings beforehand. So. When they encounter things, they say, oh, yeah, well, that's it. You know, this is the one that's going to actually devour. You're going to be devoured now or ripped to shreds. The wandering soul can become terrified and flee in panic, and in so doing can become lost. These hallucinatory experiences helped inspire the strangest incarnation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It was an American translation with a new emphasis and a new title. The Psychedelic Experience was written in 1964 by Harvard professor Timothy Leary. His collaborator and protege was Ralph Metzner. I was a graduate student in psychology at Harvard and I was working with Timothy Leary and we were studying what are called psychedelic drugs. We knew nothing about them beforehand and uh, so we were exploring their potentials applications and implications for psychology and understanding the human mind. The researchers found strong similarities between the drug experience and the description of the Tibetan death experience. What typically might happen would be like a death of the former self and then there would be an intermediate period and then there would be like a rebirth of a new self and that would be the analogy to the Tibetan Book of the Dead's guidance to somebody actually physically dying. Leary, Metzner, and associate Richard Alpert rewrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a guide for psychedelic drug trips. What we did is we stripped away from the text all the specifically Buddhist and Tibetan Buddhist iconographic references. What's the core message? And the core message always is be conscious, don't be either too frightened by the frightening visions or too seduced by the interesting, beautiful visions, but remember that they're all constructions of your own mind. The language of the book was updated and Americanized, but the message remained. 
friend, listen well. No harm can come to you from these hallucinations. Relax. Merge yourself with them. A psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience became a counterculture bestseller, inspiring rock albums, underground films, and experimental theater. To this day, I get letters from people thanking me and the rest of us for uh, having written it, was that it prepared people for considering psychedelic experience as a, as a possibly authentic spiritual experience. But whatever the perceived similarities, death and the psychedelic experience are distinctly different. To a wandering soul in the Bardo, these visions may be an authentic experience and they are a terrifying one. And the Bardo ends with an encounter with the most powerful figure of all. The Tibetans call him Yama. He is death. When you passed away, you will meet the uh, uh, Yama. So Yama looks like a uh, uh, restful deity uh, waiting for you somewhere there. Yama, the Lord of Death, will examine the deeds of the dead soul. Piling up his good deeds in the form of white pebbles, and his evil deeds in the form of black pebbles. A life of good deeds will earn a positive rebirth, perhaps even entrance to the world of the gods. A life of evil will condemn a soul to rebirth as an animal, or a lifetime of torture in hell. However, the Tibetan Book of the Dead provides an escape from the merciless judgment of karma. If the soul can listen to the distant sound of the monk's chanting, he can leave the Lord of Death behind. O oh, nobly born, fear not the Lord of Death. He is thine own hallucination. Listen and go forth. With the help of monks chanting the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the soul can enter the third Bardo, where he will choose his own rebirth and meet his future parents as they engage in sexual intercourse at the very moment of his conception. The Tibetan Book of the Dead can help guide a person to a better life, but it is a person's good and bad karma that determines how one will be reborn. A saintly person can be reborn in a better life. A particularly evil person can be reborn as an animal, a demon, or, worst of all, a wraith-like spirit called a hungry ghost. The imagery there is that you have this tremendous hunger, and yet your neck is the size of a pencil. So even if you try to swallow something, you can't consume it. You are always hungry. You're very attached to previous lives, and you're never satisfied. It's a realm of great suffering. A person who has lived a good life can even be reincarnated as a god. But even better than that is the chance to be reborn as a human being. As Palma Zimbabwe instructs in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you really want to go back to a human life form. Because you have the opportunity to study suffering and realize that other people are suffering. And you have the opportunity of benefiting these people after you understand their suffering. Once you have a suffering, then you can learn something. We always say you learn something from mistake like that. So, you know, you have the suffering, then you will learn. You know, you have this reaction. Similarities between the Tibetan concept of reincarnation and modern physics have been noted by some commentators. Buddhism has a theory of a conservation of consciousness that 
that is very comparable to the scientific principle of the conservation of energy. And that is, you can do all kinds of things to energy. The one thing you can't do to energy is make it become nothing. And you can do all kinds of things to consciousness. It, too, is one of the core elements of the universe. You can't destroy space, you can't destroy energy, you can't destroy consciousness. As the wandering soul prepares for rebirth as a human, he will experience the most erotic section of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. O oh, nobly born, at this time thou wilt see visions of males and females in sexual union. Meditate upon them with great fervency. You then begin to have visions of couples copulating. That means you're about to enter into a new life. And, uh, and then you should meditate uh, very strongly and, uh, uh, and focus on choosing a favorable family. It is the final test, the moment when a soul can foresee the future and choose the next life he will live. Just at the moment when the seed and the egg are about to unite, the soul will experience bliss. O oh, nobly born, enter into the womb. Walk with thy head erect and enter into the light path of human beings. The journey ends as it began, with a long trip down a dark tunnel towards a glowing light. Only this tunnel is the womb. And the brightness is the first light seen when a newborn baby opens its eyes. It is the end of one stage, or bardo, and the beginning of the bardo called life. So then the, the message for the Buddha's teaching is, we prepare for your death. For Tibetans, death is inevitable. But it is not the end. Death and rebirth is an archetypal process. An archetype is a kind of a core, primordial image that is shared by all of humanity. That's why the Tibetan Book of the Dead was written. It's trying to tell you, no, death does not mean non-existence. It's something completely else. It's a kind of an opportunity for liberation. It's an expansion of a consciousness. I think Westerners have a tendency to put death in a shelf until it's open for them and they have no choice to look at it. The value of the Tibetan Book of the Dead is they're saying looking at death, becoming comfortable, accepting it is a better way of getting on with your life. The Tibetan Book of the Dead wants you to know that your life will go on after you die. And how it will go on will depend on how well you live. So live better, make an effort. That's the message of the Book of the Dead. For religious faiths and philosophies around the world, the decision to examine one's own mortality is a step toward wisdom. And that is as true in the streets of a western metropolis as it is in the lofty mountains of a remote Himalayan kingdom. The Tibetan Book of the Dead may be more than a thousand years old and come from one of the furthest corners of the world Yet it addresses the great question asked by every individual who has looked into the future and wondered at the mystery of death.